Let's now discover the potential from a finite line of charge, and here it is. You may recall we found the electric field of such a creature. It wasn't all that much fun. This is about just about as much fun. It's actually a little simpler, as we'll see why. So at point P, what's the potential? The line of charge is linear charge density lambda. It's got a total charge Q. It goes from minus A to A. We'll put a differential charge here. We can also consider that differential Y, the Y direction, dy dq. And a line to P, that radius line, is square root of the sum of the squares, square root of x squared plus y squared. So what's dq? dq is related to lambda. It's lambda dy. dq, differential charge, is charge per length times length. It gives you charge. And the lambda is charge per length overall, so q over 2a. So that's how we can convert dq to dy. That'll make our lives a little simpler. Now, differential, not volume, but voltage dv. It's k dq over r from a point charge. And so that's 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. dq, 1 over r times dq, I should say. So there is 1 over r, and there is dq. Now, if we want v, we have to add up all those little dvs. So let's do it. Bring the constants out. There's all the constants. Integral dy over square root of x squared plus y squared. <clears throat> well, to give us some help from the tables, that form has this result. Natural log y plus square root of y squared plus x squared. So let's go ahead and use that to our advantage consolidating the constants natural log of y squared plus square root of y squared plus x squared from negative a to a okay so v is q over 8 pi epsilon 0 a with the limits from negative a to a we get this result and very quickly that is one over the other so this is our result. It's not very friendly, necessarily. Certainly don't memorize that. But nevertheless, that's the potential from the finite line of charge. And now let's do a ring of charge. Total charge Q. We'll make this nice and put it symmetrically. Put the ring of charge symmetrically around our axial line. Along which P is located. And let's put a DQ here. And the radius is the same as it was in the previous plot problem essentially except a little different because we're talking a this is distance a from the axis so square root of a squared plus x squared now every single dq on this entire ring is that same distance away so the charge on the ring is q and the entire Q is this distance from P. So really, this is no different than taking this ring and put it into a little clump at this distance away. That would be the same potential at P. So potential is really easy to work with. V is simply K Q over R. So that's our result. So much easier than E fields because we don't have to deal with the vector nature of E fields and scalar, the potential is a scalar quantity. And now let me briefly describe for you equipotential surfaces. And it's all in the name equi, same, potential. So it's a surface with the same potential everywhere. So here's a charge distribution, and I have some equipotential lines drawn. So these are surfaces along which. The potential is the same. The potential is the same everywhere in that given dotted line. Kind of like a topographical map. You'll have a similar looking thing that surrounds a mountain, for instance. Those are really equal gravitational potential lines, meaning that the elevation is the same everywhere. So, <clears throat> here's the electric field. The electric field has particular characteristics that must be in harmony with the equipotential surfaces as well. So let's describe some of those characteristics. So first of all, the equipotential surfaces 
are always perpendicular to the E field. So everywhere, for every E field line, everywhere it crosses an equipotential surface, you'll see that it's perpendicular. The E field and the surface are perpendicular by definition. The equipotential surface spacing depends on the strength of the E field. So if it's a stronger E field, they're closer together. If they're weaker, like over here, the spacing is further apart. So there'd be a particular amount of potential difference from one surface to the next. And that has all to do with the strength of the E field and the spacing. Moreover, conductors are equipotential surfaces. So the entire conductor over the entire surface is an equipotential. And E is perpendicular to the surface everywhere. So everywhere you see the E, it will be perpendicular, which must be true, of course, because if there was any component that was not perpendicular, then it would move charges around because of force, there'd be a net force on the charges, and they move around until it met that condition. No work can be done by the electric field on the charge and moving it over a surface, and you should know why. And of course, the reason is because if we put a test charge here, the force is from the E field, and the force is always going to be perpendicular to the surface, the equipotential surface. So if you move a charge along the surface, there will be no force in the direction of its motion, therefore no Wee. work. Uh-oh. Did you enjoy that? Well, that's what it looks like. It's a very relaxing kind of ride when a charge goes around an equipotential surface. It's very relaxed and calm. Doesn't get all worked up. Now notice equipotential surfaces just can't be chosen by us, like Gaussian surfaces. We can choose them. This is very different, even though it's just a, da it's a dashed line. The equipotential surfaces are totally determined by the nature of the charge distribution. The resulting electric field will, you could consider it to be a causal agent for the type of surface, equipotential surface that you get. So that's a brief overview of the idea of equipotential surfaces. And now on to potential gradients. Well, the idea of the potential gradient is the idea of an electric field changing in three-dimensional space. So if we know how the potential varies, can we determine the E field? You know, as we go with an E field, the potential changes, right? We've already learned that. The work done by an electric field in moving a charge from A to B is the integral of F dot dl, which is from A to B, Q0 E, the force, dotted dl. So VA minus VB is work AB over Q0. That's our definition of change in potential. Integral from A to B of V dot DL. So there it is. Integrate the E field across that space. So that's just the E field that's parallel with DL. Same idea conceptually. So VA minus VB is, what it means is, it's the potential of A with respect to B. Now, the potential of A with respect to B is how the potential changes in going from B to A. That should make sense, because if we go from B to A, B to A, then final is A, initial is B, A minus B, right? So that's the change in going from B to A. So that's equal to the integral from B to A of the way in which the potential changes. So integral from B to A of dV, which is minus the integral from A to B of dV. Hopefully I said B to A here. So minus the integral from A to B of dV equals this thing, integral from A to B of E dot dL. So dV is equal to E dot dl, those are connected. So minus dv, I'm sorry, uh, 
minus dv is equal to the integral minus dv equals e dot dl if you look at these we have the subscripts the limits being the same here a to b a to b so minus dv e dot dl so e parallel what's going on here come on now settle down would you okay e parallel then is just equal to minus db dl just by dividing both sides by d dl so we're informed about the electric field by the rate at which the potential changes in space and it's equal to that negative change so minus dv is ex dx plus ey dy plus ez dz not necessarily so easy but really it is quite easy this is handled well by the idea of the gradient keep in mind the previous result we got the potential decreases in the direction of the electric field and increases when you go in the opposite direction well the E field has a direction in 3d space at any any given point so we can partial it out in terms of the three spatial directions one at a time will not vary in the others which are the I called partial derivatives that's the idea of partials so we have e in the x e in the y e in the z ex partial v partial x e in the y partial v partial y the rate at which the potential changes in the y direction and then partial v partial z in unit vectors this can be expressed as follows the electric field collectively is the negative of the partials in the x and the multiply it by unit vector i which specifies the direction it's partial v partial y j partial v partial z k and that quantity in the brackets there is the gradient of v symbol grad upside down triangle so there's the electric field boy the electric field in three-dimensional space is quite spastic settle down now there we go e is minus grad v negative gradient of v here's a equipotential surface and we look at a perpendicular to that surface that's the direction of the gradient the gradient points in the direction in which v increases most rapidly with a change in position so most rapid change in the potential which has something to say about the electric field the direction of the electric field is in the direction in which v decreases most rapidly because if you go in the direction of electric field the potential goes down so the direction e is the direction which v decreases and it's always perpendicular to an equal potential surface through that point as shown here well, this is a fairly abstract idea um, just for your conceptual understanding and keep that in your mental repertoire